investment by Australia in Asian languages and culture programs within Australian universities will improve the understanding of Asian countries. To conclude, I would simply say that the Asian century will help in elevating the current level of international and regional community by building to face the challenges likely to occur in the next 20 to 25 years. This will also help the international community to approach the many global challenges we face from a broader perspective. And if Australia rights this trust, it will be very deeply engaged from the business perspective as we see it from India. Thank you very much, Dr. Prakash. I'm very thoughtful. Thank you. And of course, shortly there'll be the opportunity for you in the floor with the roving microphones which will be made available for you to ask questions of our panel. And I will, when you do ask your question, just stand, uh, briefly introduce your name and title, keep the question very short uh, to give us the chance to have strong interaction with the panel. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, another dear friend of Australia who retains Australian connections, even from his post in Beijing. Uh, formerly Indonesian ambassador to Australia, currently Indonesian ambassador to China, which should provide an interesting view of Australia in the Asian century, Ambassador Imran Kota. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, he's a good friend of mine for ages, I believe. And I'm very glad to see a couple of my old friends also attending this very important event. Thank you for bringing, back, bringing me back to this uh, beautiful country and continent. I think uh, I will try to uh, be as brief as possible to allow people attending this to question us. Uh, I think engagement between and among ourselves uh, is very important. I will try to start by saying that opinions I express certainly are my own. Otherwise, my consul general who is sitting over there will report back to Jakarta <laughs> as if I'm representing Indonesia in Australia. But uh, let me start by saying that Australia is a unique country. A couple of speakers have mentioned that Australia is basically representing Western civilization in the midst of our region. Asia and the Pacific. So in that role, I think Australia can play a significant and important role, trying to bridge the, those two civilizations. Australia certainly represents Western civilizations, while at the same time, it also represents Asia. And uh, in that regard, I think uh, one of the points mentioned by the chair of this uh, endeavor, Australia in the Asian century mentioned that P2P contacts is key in that regard. You cannot uh, uh, foster understanding uh, between and among civilizations without fostering P2P contacts. I'm very glad that he has visited Indonesia and the rest of the countries in the region. I welcome you. I encourage you to continue to do so. Because uh, without uh, putting in place understanding between and among civilizations, I think what was predicted by Samuel Hattington, class of civilization, could probably happen in the near future. So Australia is very unique. Australia can play a very fundamental and significant role in that regard. Because Australia understands Western civilization. Australia also, at the same time, understands Asian values. And Australia possesses a lot of qualities to do that. First, I would argue that, a, uh, that Australian society basically is considered to be the best uh, nation in terms of technology, in, in terms of services, in terms of education, in terms of natural resources. So uh, 
again, Australia is well positioned uh, to try to basically drive the region toward what we call as stability, peace, and prosperity in our region. And Indonesia certainly is a happy partner to do just that. And I think also countries in the region, we are talking about Asia, but actually we are talking about Asia and the Pacific. And, uh, and Australia is well accepted across the world. So I think one of the points that I would like to underline is that Australia should continue to play a mediating role. That is why I think the theme that we have chosen, Australia in the Asian century, is absolutely excellent. And statistics, if I can quote, I quoted it from DVAT, Australia's trade in goods and services with one part of Asia only, East Asia's, East, East Asian countries, amounting to more than 300 billion US dollar back in 2010. While Australia's trade in goods and services with the rest of the world, say for example with Europe, I think it only amounted to uh, 12. Well, one of the examples that I gathered here with the UK, your trade volume in goods and services amounted only in 2010, 22.6 billion US dollar. Well, with the Americas, you have only more or less 64.3. So that, I think, indicates the fact that your future lies in Asia. You are part of Asia. I think if, for example, somebody out there questions what is Australia all about, I would tend to argue Australia is part of Asia. Australia is part of Australia. At the same time also, as I mentioned, Australia also possesses Western values. So I think those are two uh, strongest points of Australia to play a significant role years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you again for making the effort to be with us. And last but not least, uh, to give us a global diaspora perspective from Malaysia, would you please welcome Dato Michael Yeo, who heads uh, Malaysia's most uh, substantial think tank, the Australian Strategy and Leadership Institute, but more particularly in light of the partnership that was announced last night between our two organisations, is chairman of the World Chinese Economic Forum which will be meeting in Melbourne, Australia, this coming November. Dato Michael Yeo. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking Steve for inviting me here and to congratulate the Global Foundation for a very outstanding summit. I, I do agree with most of the speakers uh, preceding me that this summit is indeed very timely. As many begin to see the 21st century as an Asian century, while there are others who perhaps argue that we are living in a global century with no country, no region dominating the world at the moment. I like to think that the theme Australia in the Asian century is very apt and profound. It is perhaps profound for me when I first arrived in Australia almost 40 years ago as a student in Monash. And, and at that time, I remember as a student visiting some of the country towns in Monash way back in 1972. In, in many of those towns, I'd never seen a nation before. And, and, and today is such a great transformation uh, right now. I'd like to also perhaps share that in, in our discussions today, perhaps geoeconomics will emerge to become a more 
important and strategic concept than geopolitics. And the rise of China, the, the peaceful development of China, should perhaps be seen from this perspective of geoeconomics. The geoeconomics and the rise of China is a structural shift in the locus of growth in the global economy. And this, I argue, is a, is a geoeconomic shift. China's rise will have immense opportunities for Australia and the entire Asian region. For Southeast Asia, in particular, the China ASEAN Free Trade Area of the China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement has resulted in double digit growth in bilateral trade. In the year 2010 itself, bilateral trade between China and ASEAN went up by 37%. China is now ASEAN's largest trading partner, and the ASEAN region is China's third largest trading partner, with bilateral trade now exceeding US $300 billion. Chairman, I'd like to also say that Australia can capitalize on the enormous goodwill that you have in the ASEAN region and also in other parts of Asia. The Australian alumni network out in Asia is huge, and I think Australia can capitalize on this large alumni network to punch above your weight in Asia.